thank you, uh, Dr. Sisson, and uh, I'm very pleased to have been asked to uh, participate in this event and say a few words, and a few words is only what I will say, because more interesting people than me are here on the panel today and certainly know more about this particular volume. But when I look out in the audience right now, I am reminded of where I and many of us are now in our lifespan. As uh, the French would say, very graciously, dans le troisième âge. Uh, many of you out here I know for a long time, actually. Uh, I can still recognize your faces. I don't know if you can recognize mine, but can you imagine some of us have even changed uh, during this period of time? And uh, in that context, one starts to reflect on anniversaries. This year is actually an anniversary for me. As difficult as it even for me to realize that it's a half a century ago, that is 50 years, was the first time that I went to Ukraine. And actually, I found myself unwillingly in the city of Lviv, where I don't spend too much time recently, but this year I was there three times, actually three times in the last three months, so I really have celebrated uh, my half-century uh, visitations to Ukraine. Uh, there's another actual anniversary, not a half a century, but rather a quarter of a century. More precisely, 27 years. I looked up correspondence recently, and uh, of course, myself, or all of us of our age, at one time were in a pre-digital, pre-computer age, I still am, so I actually have all of this on paper. And 27 years ago, literally to this month, was the first formal communication I had with uh, Peter Yatsik, who at the time was considering creating a foundation. And he requested me for some ideas about what a foundation should be like, an educational foundation, and what it should do. And actually, in December 1987, I wrote him a long proposal uh, and included as the major uh, task of this foundation a translation of the entire ten volumes of uh, Hrushevsky. Uh, from November, from December 1987 until uh, rough for the next six months, there were uh, negotiations between uh, myself as the holder of the Chair of Ukrainian Studies, now the John Yuremko Chair of Ukrainian Studies, and the yet to be formed uh, Yatsik Educational Foundation, <clears throat> uh, including even a visitation to the Board of Directors of this newly now created foundation in the spring of 1988. And this uh, question of the Hrushevsky translation was the main uh, suggested uh, activity. Uh, though interestingly, uh, Mr. Yatsik was initially skeptical about doing this translation. But in the end, uh, things moved so that by the summer of 1988, which was six months after these talks uh, began, uh, Peter made the decision to, in fact, establish not only a educational foundation, uh, but to uh, carry out this program at the University of Alberta uh, with the creation of the Center for Ukrainian Historical Research. Uh, and soon after that, when it was created in early 1989, uh, the scholar from Harvard, Professor Frank Sisson, our colleague, became the director. 
Uh, actually, I remember when asked, I proposed that this project could be carried out in 10 years, a volume per year. Uh, even for me, that was a bit optimistic. Uh, but here we are 27 years later. Uh, and we do have not only a uh, Ukrainian uh, Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the University of Alberta, which has actually done a whole host of things, but in fact, as we've just heard, has in fact, in these just under a quarter of a century, or 27 years, or 25 years, however you want to look at it, uh, put out this incredible body of material which the argument that some of us who work in the field and teach Ukrainian history had argued all along needed to be done since all the West knew if they were serious was Solovyov and Kluchevsky and hadn't even heard of Kluchevsky <coughs> except for an article of 15 pages saying how the history of Eastern Europe should be rewritten. Now the English-speaking world, thanks to this project under the direction of Dr. Sisson uh, is in fact exists and it is nearing completion. And we've heard what I can say as a user of these things and also someone who assigns it to their students, these are not just simply translations. Each of these volumes is a major scholarly work unto itself. I mean, yes, there's Ruszewski. In many ways, one can suggest that Ruszewski is the excuse to revisit various historical periods that need to be revisited after close to 100 years since she wrote some of this stuff. And we know, by just looking at the existing volumes, this team of editors, researchers, translators, I mean, you know, it's not easy to translate, and Khrushchevsky is not the greatest stylist in the world. And we've heard about Marta Olinik, just the English language, and the ability in consultation with the staff to render into readable English very complex terminology, very complex idea, uh, 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 ideas, if you will. This is a talent in and of itself. Uh, and we have substantive introductions. These are kind of works of scholarship in themselves to each of the volumes. We've heard about this. Glossary, notes, corrected bibliography. For those who work on this project, it drives these people crazy to get quintessential late 19th, early 20th century uh, mentions en passant to works and then go find these works. I know from some of our colleagues it takes them half a year sometimes just to track down an offhanded comment or a reference that Ruszewski had made, but they have done all of this. So we have actually have concrete data on these things. And then updated bibliography. So now we have essays uh, about subsequent literature on particular topics since Ruszewski's time. The maps, they're actually readable. Not only are they informative, but you can read them, which in and of itself is a talent. A talent which I assume that the editors have contributed to by forcing cartographers to leave things out. Because when you make a map, it's easy to put in a lot of information. That's the easiest thing in the world. It's putting in a little bit of information and throwing out things to make it readable, that's the greatest challenge. And again, this is just another one of the aspects of these volumes, including, of course, the covers, which in and of themselves are carefully chosen uh, works of art. So actually, it's quite gratifying that the idea to, to translate this uh, finally, and this wasn't the first time, people had tried it earlier in the 50s and 60s, it's now come full circle, and I, as holder of the John Yaremko Chair of Ukrainian Studies, uh, and, plea, and a member of the Chair of Ukrainian Studies Foundation, uh, is pleased to be here today on behalf of those two institutions, uh, each of which in its own way 
has helped and made possible at least the first uh, research stage of this uh, volume 10. And may I only end by saying thank you, and I think it's appropriate to say thank you on behalf of all of us who work in the field of Ukrainian studies in the English-speaking world for this phenomenal achievement. And there's only one thing that's left to say and wait for volume two, three, four, and five, because here we're going to get that portion of the history of Ukrainian lands, which is even less known, I would argue, and some might argue, uh, except for the later Kiev and Rus period, which is well known, but now we're going to get the, the quintessential statement on the end of Kiev and Rus, or the latter period, from Grushevsky, and then that very important period of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So again, I thank all of you who have had the remotest thing possible and relationship to this project for an incredible achievement. Thank you very much.